What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to Real Talk with Zuby. Today, we've got on a really special guest. This is a man whom I admire. I've been watching his videos on YouTube and seeing his content online for, wow, I want to say the best part of a decade. So it's truly an honor to have him on my podcast today. And this is the one and only Elliot Hulse. Welcome to the show, man. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, Zuby. I see you doing amazing things too, brother. So keep it up. Thank you very much, bro. I appreciate it. So yeah. I've done a little bit of an intro there, but for people who aren't so familiar with you, tell them a little bit about who you are and what you do. I am a strong man and a strength coach by trade. That's what I do. I started lifting when I was in high school and uh, I was mentored by my uncle who was a martial artist. He was a power lifter. He was a bodybuilder. He ran marathons. He was a very, very influential man in my life. And um, I knew when I got into high school, when he started, he actually became a personal trainer in, in 1993. Mm -hmm. And I must have been about 14 years old. Um, I knew that that's when he put that barbell in my hand for the first time, I knew that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I was like, I, I was genetically designed to do this and I was inclined to do it just by, uh, but just the excitement of growing stronger. So I use that to play college football and study exercise science. And I ended up starting my own gym mm. called Strength Camp uh, way back in like, uh, it was 2007. And it was, it was the first time that YouTube came out also. And so I, I started using YouTube to get people to come to my little warehouse gym mm. back in 2007. And uh, I was doing it mainly so that the people that were coming to my gym would share the videos with their friends so that I can get some referrals. And little did I know that people would be watching it worldwide and asking questions. And so, you know, as a as a strength coach, but then also as an athlete, I was competing in strongman at the time, uh, flipping tires, lifting stones, dragging trucks, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I started putting my videos on YouTube and within, you know, a couple of years, it blew up and my strength camp channel reached over a million subscribers. And uh, I found that I had just as much fun talking to young men about being strong in their lives mm -hmm. and you know, not just fitness, but when, when somebody trusts you with one part of your life, it's, it's easy to start trusting them with other things. And the young men started coming to me with questions about career, school, parents, girls, things of that nature. And I would give my opinion. And apparently people like to hear what my opinion is. So it, it just blew up. Most definitely, man. Well, firstly, I love, I love what you do, man. It's super inspiring. Um, I think the number of people that you've inspired and motivated and continue to, I know you know it's already a big number, but with the power of the internet, I guarantee you that it's so many more, probably multiples more people <laughs> than you even imagine. Um, like I said, I've been I've been checking out your stuff from man. I really want to say maybe like for like eight or nine years, something like that. I remember there was really a time where there was this sort of golden era of fitness on on YouTube. It's still kind of mm -hmm. there, but I think with all these new platforms coming up, less of the focus is on YouTube now. People are like looking at Instagram and TikTok and all these other things. But there was an era where you know yourself, Chris Jones, Omar, Esof. Um, Athlean X, like they're, they're Hodge, Hodge twins when they were just doing the, the TMW mm -hmm. stuff. Like it, it, it was, it was like this beautiful era. Cali muscle. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Cali muscle. Yeah. It was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Yeah. And there are all the collaborations and stuff like that. So that was when I really was like, you know, constantly checking out the videos and it's been really interesting to see how things have really evolved for you. Like you said, so it's gone from just being strong, strong body to strong mind, uh, you know, phil philosophy, religion, relationships, career, finances, all these different aspects. And I think that's so valuable because I think one thing that we really have in the West right now, and I know you talk about this, is an absence of masculinity, an absence of father figures, right. um, cultural subversion. So a lot of the stuff I, I talk about, especially on Twitter and on this podcast, yeah. just a lot of various forces infecting every single area of society and have been, you know, have been for decades, maybe even for for centuries or for millennia. And it seems like we're at a period right now where, I don't know, on, on one hand, it seems like stuff is kind of good and normal. But on another hand, it feels like 
we're living in upside down land and left is right and wow. up is down <laughs> and everything's just inverted. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the the sort of evolution of your work over the years? Well, as a strength coach, I work mostly with young men. Mm -hmm. uh, I played football, so I had a lot of football players. And then there was basketball, baseball. So the majority of the men that I, the, the people that I work with were young men. And one of the things that kept coming up in terms of, you know, why a lot of them weren't succeeding in other areas of their life uh, ultimately points back to what's happening in the family. Mm. And as you mentioned before, that fatherlessness is really the greatest plague to our society. And that if you want to destroy the society, you destroy the family. And if you want to destroy a family, you destroy the man. If you want to destroy the man, you emasculate him, you get him out of the home, you put him in prisons, you get him addicted to porn, you get him addicted to drugs, you get him really dumbed down and weak. Uh, and then we're much more easy to manipulate. I was just watching, a, somebody sent me an Instagram video just now, literally about 10 minutes ago, I was watching it. And it was talking about how people were just rolled over so easily with this COVID, these COVID mandates, right? Yes. Everybody wearing a face diaper, everybody doing social distancing, everybody just following the, you know, they're just doing what they're told. Mm -hmm. And the guy in the video said that, you know, if this would have happened, uh, the video was actually about rappers. And he was talking about how uh, rappers today, they dress up in, in women's clothing and they're very effeminate. And he grew up in the 90s, so did I. So it was like, you know, we had Biggie and Tupac, Mob Deep, you know, like yeah. these were masculine men. And you say, he was just kind of pointing to the fact that the evolution of the, of the music and the movies and, you know, the propaganda that we received through Hollywood is commensurate with the way men are behaving today. And if it was, you know, he said 30, 40 years ago, uh, we wouldn't, men wouldn't have so easily just rolled over and, you know, taking it up the proverbial ass in terms of, uh, the way we've been allowing ourselves to be step walked all over with regard to COVID. So anyway, anyway ultimately, uh, the real issue and what I aim to, you know, shed light on and be a voice for is the restoration of the family, but the restoration of the family is only is only possible when men become men again. Men are allowed to be men again. Men are willing to step up and be that be that masculine counterpart to what is what is beautiful in women. Mm -hmm. But of course, we got the roles reversed these days, and it's hard it's hard for women to even know what a woman is, much less for a man to be a man. So we have to, like you mentioned, you know, what is up is down, and what's what's right is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm holding on. I'm a traditionalist in a lot of ways. I'm holding on. I'm trying to trying to push back because the culture is so perverted. Yeah. Why do you think it's gone this way? Um, I saw actually you did um, a podcast with my with my friend Mike Mike Ruiz uh, recently, hey. and I know you. Uh, <laughs> it was it was interesting. You know, you were talking about you know actual cultural Marxism and the influence of the Frankfurt School, the long march through universities, a lot of stuff that is very real and is documented and is having real world impacts right now. But even the people who propagate these ideas, most people don't actually know the original source of it, right? Most people have never heard of the Frankfurt School. Most people have never heard of some of these names, whether it's Foucault or Derrida or um, Marcuse or some of these people who have been actually very, very mm -hmm. influential uh, John Money, people who have been very influential on the way people think today and on some of these ideas. They don't really know the sources of them. And so they end up sort of acting like useful idiots where they go around parroting these ideas without really even knowing where it comes from. And they start to think it's their own original thought, not realizing that they've actually been intentionally brainwashed um, right. over a period of decades. So one question I have, and this is something I wonder as well, I have my own theories on it, but yeah. I'd be interested to know your take, which is why do you think it's really been coming to such a head over the last decade or so? Because lots of these ideas have existed for 50 years or more, but they used to be very much confined to little nooks and crannies of weird universities. But now a lot of these ideas have become very, very mainstream, and it seems like every single institution from the churches to various companies to um, non-governmental organizations, governmental organizations, everything has just been tainted 
with some of these ideas, um, postmodernism, gender ideology, racial, uh, critical race theory, identity politics, like it's like nothing is safe. So why has that happened so recently, do you think? That is a really good question. Why now, right? Yeah. And a lot of these, a, a lot of this ball started rolling after the two world wars, you know, and then most prominently in uh, the 60s with the quote unquote sexual revolution and feminism taking the role of uh, destroying the family ultimately. Mm -hmm. But why and how has it reached the peak that it has right now where I believe that, you know, the, the cherry on top is what we're experiencing in 2020. It's almost poetic. I think it's poetic, you're right, like 2020s, like all of a sudden, you know, represents vision. And it's like, are we are we waking up or are we recognizing how blind we really are? A part of it might be, you know, in order to to dance with your question there, a part of it might be that we're seeing more now than we were able to see before, where darkness abounds, where sin abounds, the light brights is even brighter you know the, the the bright the shine the shine of that light that candle is so much more prominent when there's when there's pitch dark mm. and so uh at this at this point in history we've never really been able to have access to the type of information that we had so part of it and this is just coming off the shoot from my hip here i do have other ideas but ultimately is we never had this uh level of communication with one another right like you know, maybe there were people that knew this stuff, but they weren't making YouTube videos, right? Mm -hmm. They weren't they weren't writing books. They weren't on social media. They didn't have blogs and websites. They didn't have podcasts. There was no way for these these uh, fringe people with their quote unquote conspiracy theories to disseminate these ideas. Where today, mm -hmm. while people are having all kinds of conversations that enlighten, and when that happens, uh, it seems like it's worse. Mm -hmm. uh, because people because people know but actually i do actually think it is <laughs> it is legitimately yeah, no, I, worse. I, I think it is worse i mean there are ideas that people are floating around now that even if in 20 that even in 2010 people would have not entertained right, right. The, the notion it definitely that, is yeah the idea that a man can menstruate a man can get pregnant mm -hmm. um a woman can have a penis etc right you know there right. have been people who are transsexuals for a very long time you know even the even the the term has changed right you know transsexual that's someone who's undergone a hormonal therapy and gone through right. um an actual sex change surgery right so someone who's actually committed right you know whereas right. these days myself or yourself could literally just say that we're we're a woman now and we say so and these are our pronouns and the entire right. world is supposed to completely entertain this delusion and act like there's nothing going on here and it's like it's like a big game that's being played a little bit like I feel like the whole pandemic response. It's like this big mm -hmm. game where the emperor, you know, the emperor has no clothes or maybe he's just got his underwear on. But we're all here. Well, not all, but a majority of people like everyone, virtually everyone I've spoken to privately, even the people who, you know, go along with all the rules knows that it's suspect, like knows that it's some, some, it doesn't all make right. sense. Right. They said, don't wear a mask. Then they said, no, wear a mask. And they say, wear, no, wear two masks, all within less than a year. They're right. saying, um, you know, when you walk into a restaurant, you have to have a mask on. But once you sit down, you can take it right. off. And if you go to the bathroom, you have to put it back on. So people are literally wearing it for three seconds as if you can catch it if you're standing up, but not if you're sitting down. They're putting in curfews as if like, you know, COVID is a gremlin and it wakes up at, 10, at 9 p.m., at 10 p.m. It de depends on what city you're in, actually, right? Some cities it wakes up at 9 p.m. Some it wakes up at 10. Like, so many of the rules don't make sense. They said that um, the lockdown protests in the USA uh, spiked the cases and led to the spread. Two weeks later, you've got all the BLM marches and protests and riots. Right. And they didn't even just say that it didn't spread it. They said that the BLM protests reduced. <laughs> I saw an article saying that it reduced the spread. And I you know, you think, OK, surely at some point people have to be like, wait, hang on. This doesn't right. make sense. Right. You know, it started with right. three weeks to slow the spread, flatten the curve. And now it's stay at home until you accept communism. So that's like a little bit of a rant on my part. You probably know how I feel on this. But um, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. It seems like in the past in the past 10 years, I feel like even from 2011, say to 2021, 
it does seem like there has been a significant shift and i'm i'm trying to pinpoint this myself but i'd be curious mm -hmm. to know if you have any ideas mm -hmm. a part of it might be that we literally are in the fourth quarter mm -hmm. right so you got to ramp up those efforts if you're going to win that game and it is a battle it is a battle between good and good and evil and they're pulling out evil, which I believe the, the, anything that is not life engendering, right? So, for example, uh, the whole transgender thing is not life engendering at all. It's a part of the plot to destroy the family because if you castrate, chemi chemically castrate or allow young people to cut off their body parts when they're young, they're not going to have families. They're mm -hmm. now they're ruined for life. Yes. And you see now that there's uh, there's studies coming out where people who make this decision early in life they regret it. They grow up and they regret it because they were following some trend because of all the YouTubers or because of the Netflix and the propaganda that they watch that, that confused. Children are confused. I don't even understand why children even have, have to have, have to confront this. Why does a 10 year old kid have to confront this even as a question in their life? Well, th there's a, is an apparition, uh, a Catholic Marian apparition that says that the final battle will be for the family. And so we know that we're in the we're the final battle, the very final battle, because this is all about sexuality is the is is the energetic force behind family, right? That's why we have family is, is sexuality, sexuality. And so the greatest perversions that we're seeing right now are literally attacks on our sexuality and attacks on our family. And I don't think you can go any. I don't think it could get any any darker. I don't think you can attack anything more fundamental right what's more fundamental than the sexual polarity right i mean it really it really animates everything and so if you're going to attack like the root of what allows the people to thrive you of course the family has been under attack but now and they, the family's been under attack since you know 1960s 1970s divorce laws and, and mm -hmm. things of the nature and how that has panned out and you know 90% of divorces are initiated by women and things of that nature. But right now, the attack on the literal attack on what makes a man a man and what makes a woman a woman is uh is is chopping at the root of our very nature. Mm. And so it's gotta be it's gotta be that last that last stand. It's got this is definitely the last battle. Mm. Why is the West in particular so susceptible to this? Because a lot of people say that the world has gone crazy, and mm -hmm. I often correct them and I'm like, no, nah, it's the West and especially the anglosphere so why do you think why do you think that is i mean the majority of the world is not is not dealing with this stuff is it just because they have real problems um and we've become too comfortable do you think guilt guilt and shame if you think about how uh the after the holocaust how much shame was poured upon the german people uh, and how much guilt they held, and it's still it's still rooted in their DNA. And the people themselves mm -hmm. are are they're they're guilt ridden, shameful people. Um, as a result their, of their quote unquote uh, genocide, and I'm not I'm not questioning whether or not that happened, but the fruits of it bring us to where we are today in terms of you cannot talk, you can't say anything about Jews. Mm -hmm. The minute you mention the Jew, you are what? What? Be careful, anti Semite. Even if you're pointing out trueness, truth. You can't, you're, you're going to be in trouble. You don't say anything about it. And if you're German, you're a Nazi immediately. Mm -hmm. what? Well, you have something to say there, Nazi, right? You want to voice your opinion. You want to step up. You want to say something about how your country's being uh, flooded by immigrants who are <laughs> not even immigrants, but these uh, folks that what they call refugees, right? Mm -hmm. From these countries that are being blown up next door because of imperialism, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know the the, the industrial uh, how they call the uh, war machine um military industrial complex right yeah so i suspect you know if you look at like the roots of of, of marxism you know the 1917 the bolshevik revolution and then how it unfolded and ended up in the two world wars and in the entire the entire uh paradigm or What's that word? I'm drawing blanks today. Um, okay. Narrative. <laughs> yeah. Narrative of the oppressed Jew and the, the oppressor Nazi. That, that's kind of a script. That's a script that you can use to oppress a certain, a certain type of person and to, and to sort of topsy-turvy -turv, topsy the entire culture. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that you can do that you know, uh, with maybe something that was present, 
i.e. the Holocaust, yeah. means you could bring up old stuff. <laughs> you could bring up old stuff and you could do it all over again in a country that maybe didn't have a Holocaust, mm -hmm. but say maybe African slavery that happened 400 years ago. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, now how do we, cre how do we create this topsy-turvy where now we make not just Germans, but all white people feel guilty and ashamed for who they are so that they would very easily bow down, kowtow, and allow themselves to be, to be walked all over and manipulated by the, the I'm going to say this, but you know, instead of the, the contrast, the, but the new Jew, which mm -hmm. would be blacks in America, in the West, mm -hmm. uh, as well as every other victim class that you create, women. So you got women, you got blacks, and then you have uh, now, which is like the is feminist, like uh, feminine third wave feminism uh, intersectionality, yes. where it's like you know you've created all kinds of fake victim groups, and just like the Jews and the, and the Germans the it's now a matter of what well, we are all oppressed by anybody who's white <laughs> because 400 years ago and because you're in charge and because uh we are the victim and so uh, white people are interesting to me because they just they just take it they just receive it they just <laughs> right I don't understand. I don't know if it's in their nature because they're nice people or something, but they're just like, oh, okay. Well, then we're just gonna we're gonna just bow down. We're gonna kiss the boots. We're gonna. We, I think the most ra racist was racism in America right now. The cra craziest racism is white people against white people. They they're racist <laughs> for themselves. They hate themselves. They're self loathing, yeah. and they attack each other about being they say it's not even good enough that you're not racist right because most no, 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 no. <laughs> it's not my experience that most people are racist yeah. but it's not even good that you're not racist you have to be actively anti-racist <laughs> yes yes now, and now it's created you, a mess yeah now if you want to get away with anything you just put the word anti in front of it so if you want to just get away with being racist you just call yourself an anti-racist you want to get away with fascism? Call yourself an anti-fascist. You want to get away with anything? Just just put the anti in front of it, and people will people will buy it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and th that's the funniest thing. I mean, I, I mean, I've, I've said this for at least a decade, but the most certainly now, I mean, the most prevalent racism, sexism, um, actual misogyny, etc., yeah. is not coming from the right. You know, it's coming no. from the so-called <laughs> it's coming from the so-called progressives. These are people who literally right. want to segregate universities. These are people who are trying right. to allow men to participate in women's sports, who want to allow right. men to enter female prisons and changing rooms and showers, etc. These right. are the same people who are literally judging people based on their skin color. Right. <laughs> You're black. So firstly, the fact that they even view the world as being simply white people and right. POC, horrible term, people right. of color, right? As if we're just laundry, you know, you got the whites and then you got the coloreds and you, you know, I find it also funny that somehow colored person is really rude, but person of color is totally fine. Funny. It's weird. Um, yeah. right? <laughs> it's really weird. So, so they've subverted the language and they use this really bizarre terminology, right. um, you know, privilege, uh, everything right. is systemic or institutional or structural right like they have all these right. these ghosts and apparitions which you can't really fight and they'll just come out with crazy statements they'll just say you know america is a systemically white supremacist country right and they'll just throw out these words you know heteronormativity and right. you know intersectionality they just, they just throw out these buzzwords that they learned in their soci sociology 101 and then if you and then even if you are a black person, you know, the amount of lectures I've received from white progressives about what it's yeah. like to be black, especially over the past year, people, you know, lecturing me about BLM. It's like, you know, I, I knew Black Lives Matter. I've known that my whole life. Like, I'm, I'm sorry you only realized last year, right? <laughs> you know, I, I, did, yeah. I didn't, I didn't, it wasn't last summer where I suddenly realized that. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm going on a little bit of a rant here. It's not even really, it's not even really mm -hmm. a question, but, but feel free to jump in. Mm hmm. Yeah, man, it's strange. You know, the first, that's why I think the founders had the First Amendment be about language, right? Mm -hmm. Freedom of speech. Because once you start attacking the language, I like that word spell. You know, like somebody casts a spell on you. 
but what do you what do you use to make words too you got to spell mm. and words are literally like spells man and when you start manipulating the language and you start making certain words off off uh off the table and then you start making this craziest thing they making up words they're making up <laughs> brand new words they're it's they're putting us under a brand new spell yeah. these words don't mean anything these are made up words that's the craziest thing that when people start throwing these words out me at me and they think they're so woke i'm like that's not even a real word bro you <laughs> made that up somebody told you that because they because they want to put you under a spell and you're trying to hypnotize me with it that doesn't mm -hmm. that doesn't exist and so what happens after that after you shut people because basically that's what the language does it shuts you up it shuts yeah. you up with all these ad homonyms and these fake terms and they just make stuff up that like if you and people if you're not privy to it and somebody starts throwing these words at you it's very easy to be like like shocked like whoa wait what you calling me a that I yeah. and like you don't even have the defense for it because you're, you're out of the loop you don't know the secret language mm -hmm. so you, you really can't even argue with them because they're speaking a totally different language but once you shut people up and i think the masks are so even sort of a, a symbolic is symbolic of what they've done to our language it's like just shut these people up just shut up mm. they put, you put this mask on after the mask look at what the second amendment is then you take away their ability to defend themselves you can't defend yourself verbally which is mm. is the righteous way we should be able to defend ourselves verbally we should be able to have open conversations but when you take away the, we the weapon of the word right the next thing that a person has is his is look let me at least i gotta defend myself physically now yeah. right and so what they're coming for next is the guns. So once they shut you up and they disarm you, then genocide. And it's, it's funny because it's going to be a righteous genocide because everybody they kill, even if they kill you and you're black and they kill me and I'm black, half black, it doesn't matter. We're still white what nationalists. Is, what does Joe Biden say about that? It depends who you voted for. You right? ain't black. You ain't black. <laughs> I can help it. You ain't black. Yeah, that's dude, dude. It's not even about black and white. You saw that they did to Justin, Justice Clarence Thomas this week. They shut him up during Black Week, Black Month, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they shut him up because it's not about black or white. It's about control. It's about dividing control and conquer. And so they're gonna they're gonna genocide us, and it's gonna be a right. They're gonna feel righteous about it because we, you know, we're the enemy. You gotta shut them up. When, when you say that, do you mean, when you say genocide, do you mean that literally or are you saying that metaphorically? Well, you see it already. When you sh when they cut people off, first of all, first they're going to cut you from social media, right? And in our world, what it, what is our avatar, right? Like you and I, I don't know you, bro. I, we never met, but I know your avatar. I see your Instagram. I see your Facebook or your uh, YouTube. Mm -hmm. So you kind of, in a way, they've built a fake world, an avatar world. It's a fake world, right? It's not a legit world. We're still just digits on the screen. And you're much more easily manipulative, manipulated when it's not reality. Same thing with the words. It's easy to manipulate in the imagination. And a lot of the imagination, a lot of the manipulation is happening first in the imagination. So it's like, okay, we'll, we can cut you off from be actually being someone. If you don't have a Facebook profile, like you, in a lot of ways, you you like don't even exist. Like, do you have an Instagram? No. Then mm -hmm. who are you again? Mm -hmm. Right? That's the world that we live in because it's so become so interconnected. Then how about you can't have PayPal no more? How about you can't have a bank account no more? How about you can't get a loan no more? How about you can't buy with your digital currency? You can't because we already there with the digital currency. How about we cut off your cards? How about we cut off your ability to to sell? How about we cut off your permits? How about we cut off you from flying and traveling and going to supermarkets? Mm -hmm. Right? And so it may or may not be a literal chop off the head genocide, dump into into uh ditch genocide genocide, but it will be a slow yeah, it's slow just excluding you from quote unquote society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you're seeing people openly talking about this now in terms of things like vaccine passports, right. so called freedom passes. I don't know how much of that talk is happening in the USA, but I'm over here in the UK. Oh. I mean, you know, we already lost that First Amendment. We already lost that Second Amendment. <laughs> we, 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 didn't, we haven't had those for, for a long time. But the thing that's freaked me out the most over the past year. 
I'd say it's been two things. Number one is I now totally understand how everything that happened in the 20th century happened, hmm. which is, which is, which kind of freaks me out, mm-hmm. right? As someone who is interested in history and has always looked at things like, you know, the various incarnations of communism and the hundreds of millions of people killed, Nazi Germany, which you alluded to earlier, the Holocaust, you know, especially as a child, as a teenager, I used to look at these things and just be like, how, how did this happen, man? Like, this doesn't, this doesn't make sense. You know, I've been to Germany before. I know German people. Like, I've, I've met Japanese people. I've met people from Russia. Like, right. these people aren't, you know, they're not like psychopaths or, <laughs> you know, these are the most like kind, polite people, poli- mm-hmm. whatever. So, you know, just at the time, you know, 60, 70 years ago, like, how, how was that even possible? And now with the way the responses over the past year on multiple levels, on multiple levels, has just shown me, you know, when authoritarian control is exerted and fear is instilled in people and people are divided and polarized along all these different lines, like something as simple as a mask, something as simple as a mask has become symbolic. It's become a moral symbol. It's become a quasi religious or cultish symbol. It's become, you know, it's more about compliance and signaling than it's about medicine and science and safety, right? It's about, it's about conformity. It's about submission. It's about signaling to, to your tribe. Like, Hey, look, I'm one of the good ones. I'm complying. Don't Mm -hmm. come from my head. You've seen people snitching on their neighbors, right? We've heard about the Stasi and the Cheka and all these the, the securitat, all these secret polices that used to exist decades ago where, you know, people would snitch on their own family members, which we've right. literally been seeing, right? I saw a tweet from Aust- a woman in Australia who snitched to the police because her husband went, took their dog for a walk during the lockdown. Mm-hmm. A woman snitching on her husband, right? I know that's a one-off, but I'm just like, geez, I didn't know. I kind of did. I kind of didn't know that was possible in a way. Do you know what I mean? We don't even need snitches anymore. We are our own snitches. Yeah. Because, you know, where totalitarianism required that there would be people that tell on you and they'd be watching you. Bro, we'll watch all the time. We Mm. we walk around with our surveillance devices. We got smartphones and smart cameras and smart speakers that are literally with this bugged our home. (laughs) So we do it based on convenience where they have the the totalitarian of, of you know the early the 1900s and 1800s uh was force was violence mm-hmm. but it's crazy because now we accept it because of convenience yes they've they've harped on our our desire for pleasure mm-hmm. as opposed to our avoidance of pain mm-hmm. and it's a much easier it's much easier to manipulate people with pleasure than with pain there's an incredible book by uh by um the what the heck? <laughs> today's just one of those days uh it's called libido dominandi oh, and i can't dominandi. remember i can't remember e michael jones e michael okay, jones yeah yeah e michael jones uh and he talks about how sexual revolution sexual uh revolution or sexual freedom is actually the, the greatest form of slavery because when you make a person a slave to their sin Mm. then you can you're much more easy they're much more easily manipulated because you they want to continue in their their sin they want to continue in the pleasure mm. they don't want somebody who's going to tell them that there should be another way and they will vote for and they will do they will buy they will install they will follow anybody in anything that just continues to promise them that it's okay you can have that pleasure you can have that sin and so we do it to ourselves now mm. Mm. Well, I mean, uh, one thing that's really interesting over the past year and, you know, happening right now is, you know, it's interesting that you say that because there's also a sort of inverse of that, right? Which is that people are giving their freedoms away, right? People are right. advocating, you know, people used to fight for freedom. Now people are advocating to have their own most basic freedoms taken away. I saw just yesterday <laughs> the in Texas and in Missis- Mississippi, the governors, um, you know, opened up the states and they dropped the mask mandates. And I saw a tweet today where the where a guy literally uh, he posted a picture of a mask and he said, um, this is a messenger for Governor Abbott. Um, if you want this, you're going to have to take it from me. <laughs> I, I, I was my, I was like, wait, what? Like, I almost threw my phone. I was just like, dude, yeah. like, like on multiple levels, my mind was just blown by the statement. I was like, yeah. yo, like you if you want to still wear your mask, you can still wear your mask. He's just saying yeah. you don't have to. Right. So 
people are so people have become so slavish and this year's really it's literally brought out the uh, every hidden authoritarian in our societies mm -hmm. every dormant authoritarian has been surfaced every mm -hmm. single one has been surfaced right i've never seen so many people getting off on telling other people what to do right it's like it, it's and it and it's crazy and the the shaming and the name calling and you're a grandma killer and you you don't care about people's lives and this and that if you don't support every single draconian mandate in a way i would be a lot less disturbed if this was all coming from the government and even the media right it's it's the fact it's it's the percentage of people who have just embraced it and are for ramming it down the rest of us that's what's really freaked me out that's what's made me go oh my gosh like this is nuts in the uk now people are talking about yeah you know you should need to have a vaccine passport you should need to show your papers to go to the pub to go to the supermarket to go to the gym Right. Um, I've seen they've you know they've instituted this in Israel now. You know I was talking about this six months ago and people were calling me a conspiracy theorist. Right now people are talking about it openly, and I'm just like man, this is this is really disturbing. So I have a thought on this to tie to tie it together. Let me know what you think about this. Which is mm -hmm. that I I sense that when people are genuinely genuinely lack freedom or are in some kind of like bondage for a period of time, then they crave freedom and liberty and they value it. But when they've had freedom and liberty and value for uh, and and in comfort for a long period of time as we have here in the west for our entire lifetimes really then we we reach this weird stage that we're in now where people are actively advocating to have their rights and their freedoms taken away and restricted it just seems to be you know I grew up in Saudi Arabia so I've kind of got like an an interesting con contrast here but it really seems like people are keen to have their own rights uh, restricted. And I've never seen people, you know, and especially in a country like the USA and the, yeah. the UK, I can understand it a bit more, but in the USA, I'm kind of seeing it from a distance. And it seems like, you know, some people are kind of holding their ground, but a lot of people are like, no, we need, we need less rights. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, order out of chaos. You got order, chaos, order, chaos. It's just a cycle. It's a cycle in nature and it's a cycle in societies. And, we are coming out of one of the most chaotic times, at least, you know, recorded history. We are, I mean, just to consider that it's so chaotic that a man, that somebody born with a penis can't necessarily be a man. It's, <laughs> is, is that upside down? So with this kind of chaos, there's a primal desire for order. Mm. And of course, I'm a, I'm a traditional conservative. I, you know, I have to acknowledge that about myself because mm. I understand, because I believe the old order makes sense. The old order and particularly the old order of the home. That's really where my, my the battlefield for me is restoring the order to the home. You know, I want to see marriages work again. I want to see families work again. I want to yeah. see fathers be good fathers and women be mothers because that's their superpower. I want to see that all happen. But of course, that's all broken down and we live in, you know, we're mirrored in chaos everywhere. But this hankering for order is still there. Uh, we've been we've been uh, convinced that the old order is. Uh, you know, like you said before, it's racist. It's uh, is it everything that's wrong, and all the words that they've made up, heteronormative, all that, is is projected on the old order or the way things work, the way things they've worked up until this point. So when you have like the final, the final uh, stirring of disorder, the final stirring of chaos, which has been twenty twenty people they they want an order again it's like just just give me back normal that's why they call it is this new normal mm. and is is very is very well understood that when you create chaos and you offer a solution right you come with the solution a new order and this is what we've been aiming towards for the past 100 years at, at least the past 100 years really uh is this new world order they want to create a one world government a one world ideology one world superpower right where there's one currency all of this because you know it's not good enough to to rule your nation it's not good enough just to rule a continent we got just like pinky in the brain we got to take <laughs> over the world these guys are like the nefarious uh villains in the movies like we're gonna take <laughs> over the world and it'll not stop until they take over the world so w how do you take over the world well break down the old order, create pure chaos, give people fear of that chaos, and then offer the solution, a new normal, a new world order. And so people who are crying 
for you know to, to hold on to their to their masks because it gives them a sense of order are the same people that are going to accept all of the all of the initiations into the new global governance which is been the plan from the beginning and how do you think this relates to religion and the intentional removal of the importance of god from western society it's paramount so antonio gramsci understood that if you were going to if you're going to get the west see the west was profitable the west was doing, particularly america was doing well right it wasn't like it wasn't like russia russia was easy to topple because the people were disgruntled but even in America, even blacks in America in the 1950s were profitable. They were thriving. They were entrepreneurs. Things were going really well for everyone in America. And so the only way that you were going to, uh, I forget even what I'm talking about. Um, it. Yeah, the only way that you were going to, uh, to topple it, to win, is to, Gramsci said, you have to de-Christianize the West. You have to take God you got, because that's the authority. If you want to, if you want to, if you want to destroy, you cut off the head. Yes. And you cut off the head, and when you cut off the head, you, you're basically cutting out God the Father, and you're cutting out the fathers of the home. So ultimately, it's a matter of de-Christianizing, taking taking religion, taking order, taking authority out of the culture, make the people because if you don't have a human beings have a desire have a have a hankering for God, yes. and I think it's a, it's the same hankering for order and if we don't have a god the god of the bible or the or the god of christianity the god that, that built the west regardless mm -hmm. of your opinion of it that allowed the west to thrive so well then they will accept hollywood stars they will accept the government they will accept anybody and anything they will the greatest of all pleasures is and this is what the new age does we become our own gods. We become we become slaves to the god of pleasure, to what my truth is and what I feel. And everything that I just described, making making uh, celebrities your god, making yourself your god, making ultimately what they want, the government your god, is chaos. It's pure chaos. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's powerful. I mean, it's really it's really really interesting. Um, I, I find it so fascinating how these different how these different worlds are are connected. Um, I think that's something you realize as you as you get older and you're wiser and you study more history and you look into some of these ideas and philosophy more. And it, it's it's crazy how it, it's like everything is interconnected. Everything is interconnected. And we talked a little bit before about the emasculation of men, and that's something that um. Is interesting, and I think it's fascinating how so many people who are into uh, sports and fitness and strength training, etc. Mm -hmm. There's this, there's this stereotype, right, of uh, you know guys like myself or yourself who are visibly muscular and strong uh, that were lower intelligence, or that you're yeah. you're a meat or you're you're a meathead, or mm -hmm. you know you're stupid. You know, I've, I've had people, go, oh, why would I go to the gym? I'd rather read a book, as if it's not possible to do both. Right. Like life is an RPG and, you know, you get 20 skill points that you can assign. And if you mm. assign too many to strength, then, you know, you got to subtract a little bit on the intelligence or the charisma, et cetera, which is clearly not what happens in the real world. In fact, I found the inverse to be true. Um, so I, I'm kind of curious as someone who's a, who's a strong man, who's really into strength training, how do you, I myself, I'm trying to sort of work out this connection here because I found that there, there does seem to be a link between physicality and that discipline and I guess personal responsibility and struggle and overcoming, which does end up tying into people's sort of worldviews and beliefs and even mm -hmm. political ideas, et cetera. I imagine if you went to a strongman gym or you went to a powerlifting gym, you'd probably struggle to see someone who is like, I, 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 I would strongly imagine that the vast majority of people, for example, would be anti-mask mandate, anti-lockdown, you know, much more pro-freedom, much more sort of libertarian slash conservative values, right? They wouldn't want mm -hmm. the government to take care of them and all that. So how do you think those things connect? And well, firstly, firstly, is that what, is that also your observation? And how do you think these things are interconnected? Testosterone is man power, man juice. 
<laughs> it's what makes us men. Literally, without yeah. testosterone, we're not a man. The, the fetus is bathed in testosterone. And when a boy becomes a man, there's just this surge and this chemical in the body that, that makes a man defiant. It makes him uh, grow hair. It makes him grow muscle. It makes him stern, focused, stoic, strong. It's what differentiates between a woman and a man. A man's not a woman, mainly because testosterone. Mm. It's, the, it's, it's the power behind it all. It's what allows it to happen. And as, as far as this world uh, attacking masculinity, it has attacked us physiologically. Mm -hmm. Of course, through the food, through the pollutants, uh, you know, not to not to mention the social, you know, the social implications of, of media and whatnot, but literally testosterone levels are being attacked and they're dropping at a precipitous level with the testosterone level of, of your typical 24 year old today is I don't remember the exact statistic, but it's several is a big percentage lower than that of a man from the 1980s even, mm -hmm. just, you know, 40 years ago. Big difference between a 1980s 24-year-old and a 24-year-old today. Yeah. All the soy in the food, all the, you know, phytoestrogens, zetoestrogens, the chemicals, uh, the, the birth control pills in the water, you know, because it mm -hmm. can't be filtered out. I mean, we're bombarded with estrogens. And uh, when a man lifts, when a man, I mean, it's, I don't know if it's a chicken or an egg, <laughs> it's both actually but when a man lifts his testosterone goes up when his testosterone goes up he wants to lift more mm -hmm. it's about exercising our gift in this topsy-turvy world where women don't exercise their gift it's so crazy because everything is backwards women don't exercise their gift of making babies that's their gift just like it's a man's gift to have testosterone that allows us to lift shit and break shit and fight mm -hmm. it's just our gift so we got it but we don't use it and it's been dumbed down and has been suppressed out of us mm -hmm. is this is the this is the this is the perversion of the of the genders. Yes. Women, they don't the one thing that they can do that we absolutely can't do because we don't have their bodies just like they don't have ours mm -hmm. is denigrated. It's mm -hmm. beneath them. It's mm -hmm. there's something uh there's something lowly and poor and backwards about yes. having babies and being a mother. Mm -hmm. And so I just show that I just bring that up to draw a contrast to the same exact thing happening on the other end of the seesaw with regard mm -hmm. to men is that to be a man is to, is to be uh, toxic. Is there something wrong with you if you have too much testosterone, if you're too aggressive, if you talk too loudly, if you have too much of a strong opinion, just having big muscles, there's <laughs> something wrong with you. Yeah, yeah. So, and then they have terms like mansplaining and manspreading and man this and you know toxic this and that. And right. you know, one thing I did want to ask you about, you know, and this is, uh, you know, the podcast is called Real Talk with Zuby, is I want to connect a couple of these things because earlier on, you know, you were talking about the importance of marriage and the traditional family unit, having children, et cetera, women being wives and mothers, men being um, fathers and husbands. Yeah. Um, but as we know, in the West, this is something that a lot of a lot of men, particularly around my age, plus or minus around 15 years, have a lot of concerns and fears about, yeah. realistically, right? You know, whether that's, and you, I don't think anyone who's reasonable can claim that those things are in, invalid, right? So it's also like the institution of marriage has been subverted, subverted to a point where people who are even pro-marriage and right. pro-family, who agree with all of that stuff, still have trepidation around it you know whether whether that's because of the way that you know some aspects are technological some aspects are about the legal system and laws some aspects are just like you know society and s statistics right people are looking at those those divorce statistics going like man like these are not these are these are not great odds here what men are bringing to the table what women are bringing to the right. table everything's just kind of disintegrated to a degree where both from certainly from a male perspective, but I think even to a degree from a female perspective, the sort of I, I think marriage used to be a it, it kind of pains me to say this because I am such a pro marriage person. Right. Um, and I come from a very stable family. My parents have been together, you know, 40 plus years. But the the value of it is certainly on a surface level is a lot less. It's a lot less obvious. And the risk reward ratio 
like, you know, being kind of mathematical compared to what it used to be even just a few decades ago. Um, it's not a, you know, for someone who's a rational, a logical thinker, it's not hard to understand how someone would be like, hmm, like, I don't really, I'm not really sold on this idea. So right. what are your, what are your thoughts on that? And how do you think perhaps it could be, it could be changed? It's so funny because as you were saying that, that last phrase, it's like, why would I buy this cow when there's so much free milk yeah. everywhere, <laughs> right? But that's a part of the problem is mm. it's fornication, promiscuity, this the, the hookup culture. Because when you put sex in front of the relationship instead of putting a relationship in front of sex, then women have all the power. And so, you know, they like to say that we live in a patriarchy, but we don't. We live in a matriarchy. We live in a gynocentric world that's woman led. And so when you speak in terms of what do we do and we look at the fact that the divorce laws and the courts are stacked up against men, mm -hmm. we just look at not even how the laws are set up or people's perception. If there's, if there's a relationship that doesn't work out, it's always the man's fault, always the man's fault. He didn't, and you know what it is? It's usually something very effeminate, something very weak from the woman's side. He didn't, he didn't, he just didn't give me the tingles anymore. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I just didn't feel it for him anymore, right? All these various, uh, these made up, made up things. Um, and so they could just decide at any point, whatever they want, they could just pick up, leave. And not only that, take half your money and, mm -hmm. and take your kids. And people will, people will always side with the women. I'm not saying that there isn't abuse out there, but that word abuse has been abused. Yes. These women talk about, oh yeah, he abused me. I heard so many women, like, you know, the people that I know. And like, I know this couple, like I know this couple, I know y'all, I've seen you for a long time. And then she comes out with, well, it's been an abusive relationship. I'm like, abusive, what? What are you talking about? There's no way that guy's abusing you. Well, it's emotional abuse. What do you mean emotional abuse? Well, he's not talking to me. You can't divorce somebody <laughs> for not talking to you and call it abuse. It's a lie. It's a made up. So, it, it, so in other words, marriage is it's 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 become it's useless. It don't really it don't actually don't mean anything. And like I said before, with regard to getting the milk, when it's when it become when sex becomes first, then a lot of good men are gonna be like, well, why? Yeah. Why I could just have sex. Yeah. And I'd have to deal with this woman who's going to flip out on me and take all my money. And so when you ask me about what can be done about it, it marriage can't be fixed. Marriage absolutely oh, yeah. cannot okay. be fixed. Interesting. Marriage can't be fixed. Gender identity, real traditional gender roles need to be restored. And that means men need to become men again. And that's why my campaign is make men strong again. And women need to become women again. And it, a lot of this perversion is a result of feminism. And feminism started with, you know, the whole idea that a woman who is in a marriage, who's a wife, is a, is, is a victim, right? She's mm. suppressed by her suppressor, the husband, the whole narrative created this situation where women not only now, uh, you know, of course, I want to be able to leave my man, um, but I want to be a man now. And if you look at like all the all the movies and the media, like these women, they portray women, which is such a lie. And it's so false. And it's it's such a shame because it once again denies women their true power. Why every superhero movie now is all women? Why is those women? Why? It really it deny it. D it takes away a woman's real power when you say that she needs to be more like a man to be powerful for women to be more like a man they gotta be to, for a woman to be powerful for a woman to be a good woman mm -hmm. for a woman to be a respectable woman for she needs to be more like a man it doesn't make any sense yep but so the the my whole point here is that if we're going to restore marriage men need to know their role play their part and it's not arbitrary that's a part of the lukewarm gray world that we live in where they're trying to make everybody one homogenized mass so we're more easily manipulated men are men there's specific things men do and don't do mm -hmm. it's there's not up for like men don't wear dresses right it's just a it's, <laughs> and you know because everybody's their own god and they have their own truth you could say oh well, that's not true no it's true because if we're gonna have any kind of order in our society, there need to be boundaries. There are certain things that as a man, you just don't do. You just don't say, right? You don't behave that way. You can, but then you need to be ostracized. You need to be kicked out because you're, you're screwing <laughs> up the order here, right? But instead, they're celebrated. 
Yes. The more perverted you are, the more celebrated you Oof, are. I've got some bars. So, I've got some bars around this on the new album. <laughs> yes, because you know it, man. <laughs> so you got the more perverted you are, the more you are an inspiration. Where really, you're, the more you are a ch a child of Satan, and you're just creating more chaos. Yeah. And so, women, it's, I'm, you know, I, I talk about men because men go first. Men need to go first. Mm. Men, if we stop tolerating women's shit, they will go. They will fall into their, their place. The only reason why women have what they half of what they have is because men has given it to them. There's not a single thing that a woman has. And it's just the way it is because we are stronger. As the stronger sex, we have a responsibility. And it's right for us to use that strength in a responsible way. But it has been subverted and used against us. Mm -hmm. So now that women have, have taken from men and manipulated men in such a way that now they're in control. And they really are. And so, but once men stop tolerating it, I think the first place we stop tolerating it is with promiscuity. We're manipulated. The reason why we're so easily manipulated is because we're having sex. When you're having sex, you're an addict. You're a drug addict. Just like a crack addict needs his dealer and will do anything. Where is my, where's my dealer? I need to get my hook. I need to get my fix. Uh, you got it now? You got it now? What do you want? What do you want me to do? It's the same way these men are with regard to sex. And it goes even when it in, is in terms of pornography. So we have to literally stop being addicted to orgasm. Stop being, we've got to stop busting nuts. If men are going to be dead again, <laughs> we have to stop busting nuts because we're making ourselves weak. We're making ourselves addicted. We're making ourselves easily manipulated. So that's the first step. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's, it's crazy because, you know, people think that they're, uh, that religion it, it oppresses them because it says things like, oh, well, like, you know, sex is pleasurable. So, but you shouldn't be having sex. Or jerking off is pleasurable. Well, you really shouldn't be jerking off. So, you know, the, the, the politicians that want to manipulate us say, no, it's okay. It's good. Yeah, have as much promiscuous sex as you want. In fact, if you get pregnant, you can kill your baby. Mm -hmm. And pornography is great. So they do all this various stuff in order to make men weak. We think that it's there's something manly about being promiscuous or fornicating or jerking off the porn. Mm -hmm. Th that is nothing but slavery. So that's the first step. When men take back our sexual power, we take back our sexual powers. When we stop spilling our seed all over the place, then not only will we have uh, retained that power and not giving it away to the technology and to the women, mm -hmm. but semen retention is also an empowering tool for the way a man carries himself, the dignity that he has in himself. His self-control, that's where it really comes from, self-control. We have no freaking self-control. That's why everybody's uh, obese and addicted and, and, and spends you know 90% of their time scrolling through things on the phone is because <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're addicted to pleasure. We're effeminate. It begins know. with men. Mm -hmm. And if men fill their role, play their part, be real men, stop being effeminate, start, start experiencing start loving boundaries, start loving suffering, start loving sacrifice, letting yourself be a living sacrifice. See the power and authority because you are never, you'll never be an authority unless you have an authority and authority comes from, a, from above. Religion was created by men for men because we seek authority. Men operate in, in lines in vertical lines, hierarchies. It's, it's appropriate to deal with one another in hierarchies. This is how authority, this is how authority trickles down. Not like women, they work in circles. Women work in circles and it's okay. That's their egalitarian. That's their nature. It's not a man's nature to be egalitarian. Mm -hmm. It's man's nature to have hierarchy. And so once we can do all that and we understand the order and we operate with authority, then women will have no choice but to do and to, and to follow our lead. And you know what I think is a great way for women to be and the way that men should what we should expect from women is traditional conservative values. I don't want a slut. I don't want a woman with a lot of, a lot of a large body count. I don't want a woman with a lot of debt. I don't want a woman with tattoos. I don't want a woman with a loud, big mouth. I don't want a woman that drinks more than I do. I don't want a woman who's who's uh, all over social media showing her cheeks and her tits and makes herself into a billboard. I don't want a feminist. I want a nat or just a normal just a normal, sweet, <laughs> kind, servient, <laughs> right? So we serve each other, yeah. but to but the woman is subservient. 
right? I serve my wife. Every dollar I make goes right mm -hmm. to her. I sure. serve her, yeah. but she's subservient and she serves under me and she takes care of the children and takes care of me in that way. Uh, passive. I don't want to, I don't want an aggressive woman. I don't, <laughs> men are not, it, I don't know one man who's like, I want, I am turned on by a no. strong, powerful CEO woman entrepreneur i don't care I, I don't care how much money a woman makes there's nothing there's nothing attractive about that there's nothing attractive about a woman that has a, a whole bunch of degrees what does that prove it just proves that you are a mediocre man right you're trying your best to, to 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 fight and compete in the world of men and you want to prove yourself you a woman that does that is constantly going to be trying to prove herself i don't want a woman that has to prove herself that way to me right i want a woman that's a woman and so that requires me, you, and men be real men. Bars. Then it'll work. Then then fa families will work again. Marriage will work again. We won't need the state because we just look at the state like, get the fuck out of here. We don't care. <laughs> it's between me, this woman, and God, the Father. And that's it. That's where bars. the authority comes from. B bars, bars. Man, I, I hear that. I hear that, you know. Um, I, I'm on board with so much of that. I think, man, but we're 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 fighting against some some serious forces. You know, like there's some, mm -hmm. the the forces out there are serious because the path you are laying forward on every level, physically, mentally, spiritually, discipline, everything, that is the hard path, right? That's like playing the game on right. That's playing the game on not even just hard. That's like playing on extra hard or on brutal. That's just like, man, like mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, <laughs> that's like, geez, man. So people will even people who like hear that message, they're going to be like, geez, man, like that's a that's that's tough. So in terms of in terms of practical advice, if there's a, a young man listening to this podcast right now, then where where do you think is a good starting point? I know, of course, we're both big proponents of the gym. I like to recommend people, you know, mm -hmm. start with lift weights, get yourself physically in shape and, you know, the dominoes will begin to fall from there. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? That's a great place to begin. Okay. You know, uh, I studied the anthropology of initiation for, for a couple of years when I was going through my own form of, of initiation. And I learned a lot about how our quote unquote ancestors, you know, people of the past would relate to a young boy as he's becoming a man. And what was required, number one, is that the entire community was involved, meaning the, the women and the men. And the older men would come in and they would strip the boy away from his mother in order to introduce him to the world and atone him to the father or the world of men. And this was a necessity in order for that boy to be to be worthy in the society, for him to be able to be of some value to the people in society. He had to move away from the world of material. When, when you think of the word mother, I don't know if this is legit or not, but it's in my mind. I made this up maybe. But the word <laughs> mother sounds a lot like matter, material. Mm -hmm. And when you think in terms of the mother, you think of of, of pleasure, comfort, gratification, uh, and it's all material material comfort. The word father comes from the word pattern, right? And pattern, mm -hmm. pattern is spiritual. Pattern is above the matter. But we all are the pattern in the matter. And so there had to be a movement away from pleasure. And, and, and they knew this because the very first thing they would do when they would strip them away from the world of the mothers, they would, they would uh, subject them to austerity. Mm. They would be fasting. There will be all kinds of penance to pay. They might, you know, today we have all kinds of, you know, lawsuits and stuff. You know, we go join a fraternity and they brand you or spank you or something like that. <laughs> but it, but it, it's in our DNA. There's a pattern there that wants that, that we want it and we in a way need it. So the older men would, you know, maybe he would get tattooed or maybe he would get cut or maybe he would have to fight somebody. I was watching this one video on, uh, on I think it was on YouTube or something with these, this Africa, these people in Africa where uh, the boys, when they turn a certain age, the older men would take them to this this yearly event where they would start, they would just bare knuckle fist fight. Jeez, yeah. It was the craziest thing. And like these boys would just knock, knock each yeah. other out. But like, <laughs> you can't be, you're not a man unless you come to this event and only the men were allowed and the women would wait back. And then, you know, bring when the boys would come back, the mothers would be there and the women would be there and they would clap and they would have a big celebration. But it was austerity. It was challenge. It was tough. You, you know, these kids, one kid died and it was, oh, it wow. was a sad thing 
but it was very rare that it happened. It only happened once, mm -hmm. but they were very sad about it. But you, they had to subject themselves to some form of, of danger mm -hmm. because that's what's required for a man. And, the, and a part of the reason why that's required, that, that austerity, that challenge, that breakdown of the, of the mommy boy ego is because then you bec can become literally a clean slate because you don't have that baby boy pride anymore. You get that pride, you know, pleasure creates pride. It's a, it's a false sense of pride where like, I even remember the first time I masturbated, I must've been like 12 or 13 years old. I almost like felt a little like, oh, look at this. I'm a man now. It's a false pride. It's a false sense of pride. And we got even more with the video games, right? You know, mm -hmm. kids who are like, damn, I, I beat that boss. It's like, you didn't, you didn't beat anybody, buddy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a false sense of pride. And so that false sense of pride needs to be broken. You got to break that sense of pride. And when that sense of pride is broken, then and only then can a new imprint, almost like we're talking about chaos and order, you know, break that pride is like breaking the old order, right? You clean slate this boy. And then a new order can be imprinted on him. A new pattern can be imprinted on him. And that's when the ancestors would generally teach them the stories of the fathers, religion and mythology, the stories that, that, gave meaning and purpose to a young, young man's life. And that way, when he goes back into the society, he has broken himself of the mo mother addiction and he's now atoned to the father and he carry himself like a real man. This doesn't happen anymore. This doesn't happen anymore. But you know what? I think that's okay because the mommy addiction is so strong, stronger than it's ever, ever, ever been before because of our addiction to pleasure. That unlike the you know our ancestors who maybe they would live there, maybe they lived rough right maybe they lived rough and so the mommy addiction it was harder for them in other words they needed more austerity like you know my brother did a Native American Sundance one of the things they made him do is he had to go up on top of a mountain and sit on a rock and they draw a circle around him he had to sit there for four days no food nothing nothing wow. no food no water he had to sit there in the hot sun Jeez. that's austere but because you know th that's that was what was available to them. There wasn't, they didn't have iPhones and porn. Uh, that was, was available to them. They had to do that, right? It was like mm -hmm. the men were already tough. We got to make them even tougher. We are so soft now. We are so weak now. We're so addicted and effeminate and, and addicted to pleasure now that it could be very simple. It could be very, very simple. Just stop busting nuts. Stop watching porn. <laughs> stop going on Tinder, right? Like give yourself that break. Break that. Break that. I would say... The biggest addictions we have right now are to te te technology, mm -hmm. right? To busting nuts mm -hmm. and to food. Yes. Those are like the three biggest pleasures that sort of rule our lives. If you take most people, you could take like, you know, the biggest, strongest, toughest professional athlete, take his iPhone away from him, he'll act like a little girl. Oh, give, my, give my phone back. <laughs> give my phone. You can't He'll do fight that. you. He'll fight right. you. Yeah, yeah. You notice, you ever like leave your phone somewhere and don't know where your phone is? Like, you, it's like a crack addict. Like, what the hell? Is, where's that phone? Yeah, yeah. We're so addicted to that. And we're so addicted to, to sex. We're addicted to orgasm. And it doesn't matter if you're in a relationship. doesn't matter if you're, you're, you're a man whore or if it doesn't matter if you're watching porn. If you need to find a way to bust your nut several times a week, you're, you're addicted to that. And you have to understand that that makes you weak. It makes you addicted. It makes you weak. And you have to learn how to put some boundaries up around it, control it, see what it is. Powerful men do semen retention. There's, there's sexual transmutation that, that uh, Napoleon Hill was talking about, you know, 60, 70 years ago. Yeah. You, you know, a lot of the greatest artists and, 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 you know, men of technology, men that create the inventors, they practice semen retention. And then finally, look, all the science is proving to is pointing to how powerful the ancient practice of fasting is. If you're going to begin somewhere, it has to be austere. Men don't learn except through pain. Men don't grow except through suffering. So you got to do something painful. The first thing is, is, is breaking away from the world of the mother. And that gonna, that's going to come in, in, form, in the form of breaking away from those pleasures, breaking away from those addictions. Then and only then, when you've broken down that ego, will you be open, available for some sense of purpose and mission in your life to emerge. Before that, it can't happen. If you're, li if you're living, and all that is sinful, if you're living in sin, your intellect is darkened by that sin, 
If you eliminate that sin from your life through all those addictions, you will, you will, your intellect will brighten. You will wake up and you'll be able Amen. to be led by God the Father. That's where we got to go. Amen. And it's funny that we worked this out thousands of years ago, but here we are. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame. That's part of you know des destroying a family, right? Because there are no men to do that. There's no men to do that for us anymore. My father was a great man. He was a great man. Uh, but he didn't know because his dad was working too. You know, mm -hmm. he drew, drove, drove trucks. So there was no men. And he had to raise himself. And so for the most part, boys are raised by mommy and technology. Yeah, man. Awesome, man. Elliot, it's been, this is, this is one of those podcasts where I feel like we could go on for hours. I'd love to have you back <laughs> on again in the future. I think there's yeah, so much stuff we can talk about. But thank you so much for lending your your voice, your experience, your wisdom to this. This has been uh, one of my favorite episodes. You know, I've done well over 100 <laughs> episodes, and this has honestly been one of my That's favorites. Cool, so thank you. Uh, if people want to find out more about you or check out what you're up to, what's the best place for them to stay up to date? You know, if you're really interested in things I'm talking about, just punch my name in the internet and you'll find stuff. You know, I got thousands of YouTube videos I've made over the past decade. Uh, I spent a lot of my time on Instagram today because that's where I make my offer to my coaching program, to King Transformation okay. Program. You go on Instagram and you see me making an offer, hop on it because uh, it's about making men strong again in this degenerate age. Awesome, man. Elliot Hulse, thank you so much for coming on the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Zuby. This was great, brother.